For now, I'd like to welcome Scott and Shannon to talk to us about um, scaling up water sensor networks. Thank you. Thanks very much, Liz. I'll share my screen. Thanks very much for the invitation to speak in this series. It's really exciting for us to reach an audience in the UK and share what we're doing. But likewise, this is an opportunity for us to learn more about your programs there. We're particularly interested in the digital environment uh, program that's running there and what we can learn from that, and what lessons we can take away back to the US. And moreover, we're really excited to work uh, with Liz and others there as we try to assemble a global system for sensor networks. So the thesis that I'm going to share with you today is that there's three parts of scaling up a water sensor network. And we'll give you an example of one that went from one in our backyard at the Stroud Water Research Center to one that's now uh, national, but has the potential and is starting to creep globally. So with that as a precursor, I think the, the first place to start is to explain what the Stroud Water Research Center is. We're a nonprofit organization in the United States. We're based outside of Philadelphia, out in the countryside. So we're in a very rural area. Uh, we have a stream, a high quality, uh, exceptional value stream running through our backyard at the Stroud Center. And so that's given us the opportunity over the last 54 years that we've been in operation to do some do research in a very controlled setting, both inside our building and outside our building. So we've been, we have really amazing facilities for doing this, uh, both again, uh, facilities inside with uh, flow through streams and our greenhouse that you can see in that picture as well as an experimental watershed where we can manipulate the watershed itself and measure changes. And of course, a core part of that has long been instrumenting that watershed. So Stroud Water Research Center is also people. So we have, of course, uh, over 50 full-time staff, a couple dozen part-time part staff. And we do three things at the Stroud Center. We do freshwater research, and that's where we started as a research organization. But we also do environmental education. We have a team that reaches uh, 9,000 students per year, both in our building and outside our building with programs, and a watershed restoration team, which works mainly with landowners and farmers to implement better uh, crop management practices. So all of this in pursuit of fresh water. So that's a little bit about who we are, where we came from, and we've been doing this a while. But you might be asking, okay, where's the technology coming to play? So. Uh, I'm going to share with you today, we're going to talk about two different initiatives that are part of what we call our Wiki Watershed Technology Initiative. So Wiki Watershed is an umbrella term that we've created to refer to a variety of mainly digital, but also, uh, as you'll see, actual hardware and on the ground um, projects. So the Wiki Watershed umbrella includes things like a, a model my watershed, uh, a leaf pack network, which you'll see briefly, it'll make a uh, cameo in today's presentation, uh, phone apps, mobile apps, and one, uh, an app for looking at macroinvertebrates in great detail. So if you get a chance, and I'll share the links at the end, or maybe Shannon wants to type in the Wiki Watershed link into the chat right now. So that's all to say that we have We've invested heavily in technology at the Stroud Center. And this is definitely a team effort. And the two uh, programs that I'm gonna talk to you about today are Enviro DIY and Monitor My Watershed. And so on the right is just a, a really an abbreviated list of the partners who have contributed to this effort, both internally and externally. Um, and it is a team effort. And as you know, uh, with your programs, uh, it's a team effort to, on many fronts, uh, to create and to innovate. And so uh, that's, that's the way that we will work going forward. And we look forward to bringing new partners on board. So we've been doing technology for a while. So I thought I'd start, give you a little context for when I say a while, what does that mean? So in 2009, the Stroud Water Research Center had a, a grant from the National Science Foundation, along with other partners. And it was part of that effort that, that uh, really created the need to develop our own data logger. Although there's off-the-shelf hardware out there, as Shannon's going to explain to you 
this was, we, we found the need to do this ourselves. So it was really an in-house effort to develop our own data logger that kind of provided the springboard for all these other dominoes to fall into place. And so as we go through time, we had another grant from the National Science Foundation, which created what was the precursor to monitor my watershed, which we'll talk about today. Uh, the US EPA came into play several years later, and they allowed us to build out what became the citizen science program and innovate some of the ways in which we instruct and reach people with our programs and monitor my watershed and, and Enviro DIY have been pushed even further with uh, significant investments from the William Penn Foundation, which is a charitable uh, philanthropic organization based in Philadelphia. So all of this is to say that we didn't start out with a grand vision uh, 20 or uh, 12 years ago and say, we're gonna do all these things. It was more probably typical of many others where we start, we start in one place, we start adding uh, and putting components onto that. And uh, 12 years later, uh, we're at a place that probably a few would have thought that we would be back when we started this effort. And Shannon's gonna take you back to the origin in just a minute and explain kind of uh, more on the hardware side of things. So our thinking is that there are really, when we talk about scaling up sensor networks um, and creating sensor networks for a community of people, there's really three parts of that. There's the people, of course, and that involves from us, we think about it from not only a scientific research with our collaborators perspective, but also from a citizen science, a community science perspective uh, and, and bringing technology to people and training them how to use it. And in many ways, we're finding successful ways. We're learning important lessons along the way about how to do that. So there's training, they're sharing, they're supporting a community of people and allowing them to collaborate. There's a platform here. And so we're gonna talk about some hardware and software platforms, which give people a common interface. And these are uh, predominantly open source uh, for hardware and software. But then there's the protocols that we need when we, when we think, when we move to just thinking about the data itself that we're generating. There are protocols which we need to make that data findable, accessible, interoperable, and repeatable. And this, those fair data practices mean machine to machine uh, communication and spreading a network across uh, different uh, pro, uh, platforms of data sharing. Okay, so with that, let's start with the people aspect of things. So this is, uh, we created a program called Enviro DIY. Shannon was in on the ground floor of this, along with Anthony Oftenkamp a uh, researcher at the Stroud Center who subsequently moved to a, a uh, private company called Limnotech. And we'll, we'll mention more about his work in a minute. So Enviro DIY was the brainchild of Shannon and Anthony and others at the Stroud Center, Dave R. Scott, to create a, a uh, web-based platform where people could join together and share learning and resources. So if you go to envirodiy.org, there's three main ways that we allow people to interact with each other. Uh, by joining the website, uh, there are blogs where people can post uh, feature length uh, pieces. We have 60 right now on the website um, and forums where people can uh, use for Q&A. So I think we have at last count of like 2000 Q and A exchanges on there. Um, and we have 700 plus members of Enviro DIY now. So this has become the core of where we distribute learning resources to participants and we encourage them to really help each other solve problems. Of course, Shannon and others at the Stroud Center, Sarah Damiano are always um, waiting in the wings to help people uh, when the community outside can't, can't support each other. But what we want in an ideal world is that community-led led effort where people are giving and exchanging with one another. So that's uh, Enviro DIY. Also a note there that all of the material that's on Enviro DIY is available under the Creative Commons attribute, Attribution Share Alike license. So we're trying to promote uh, open source and Creative Commons uh, uh, perspectives throughout what we're doing. We also have a presence on GitHub uh, again, in the effort of making our hardware and software open source and build communities, people that are using this data 
Uh, there's extensive documentation on GitHub, and we invite everyone to participate so you can find us there as well. Um, just showing a few of the, uh, of the four most really used and developed repositories there. Uh, and of course, from an open source perspective, we're using Arduino, and uh, many in our, in our programs are using Platform IO as well. Okay, so that's the, that's the nutshell of how we bring people together and distribute resources and encourage the community to become over time what we hope is self-supporting. We're always there to, uh, to develop and refine the resources to distribute, but we're really going after that community perspective. So now let's move and talk about the platforms that we use from a hardware and software standpoint. And one of these is the Mayfly data logger. Uh, and of course, Arduino being an, an open source platform as well. These streamline collaboration. At this point, I'm gonna step aside and let our research engineer, Shannon Hicks, take you through some of the, the, um, the features of the Mayfly, why, why we created it, uh, why it's different, and why we rely on it internally and are uh, helping our partners with it externally. So take it away, Shannon. Uh, so yeah, so I, I've been working with um, with researchers for uh, a number of years now to to build really cool hardware to do uh, um, to, to do all the fun electronic uh, collection of data for the scientists. So uh, I was tasked with coming up with a station like what you see here in the photo uh, is is what most of our stations look like nowadays, uh, but. It didn't start out this way. It, it was a, a kind of a, a longer process to get to that. So when I first started, we were going to do the standard approach of using a lot of commercial off-the-shelf components. So uh, next slide, Scott. Uh, the typical stations that we would use would uh, look something like this. They're, they're $1,400, $1,500 just for a data logger plus some other instrumentation to make it all work together. And then you need to add a five dollars $600 radio uh, to have some sort of telemetry communication. So in, uh, a typical package, would, by the time you put it in a nice uh, large box with a large solar panel, would usually cost around 2000 to 3000 US dollars for one station. And that's just for the data logger portion of it and doesn't even count the sensors that go into the water. So when we were tasked with deploying uh, dozens of stations all over our, just our research watershed, at the Stroud Center, uh, we were going to blow our entire budget just on buying the data loggers, and we would have no money left over for the actual sensors that were going to go in the water and take the measurements. So we could easily look at the budget and say, okay, well, we can't do this the traditional way because we really want uh, a high, uh, high number of stations, but at a lower cost. So uh, if you look at the next slide, um, what I decided to come up with is um, basically building our own data logger and putting in a smaller, cheaper enclosure, but uh, which allows us to customize exactly what we need so we don't have to buy something or uh, use stuff that was a little overkill for what we needed. We could, we could target exactly the right sort of hardware that we needed with the right sort of either radios for short distance communication or cellular for longer distance. Uh, and we could easily do this for around 150 to 200 to $250, depending on how many features we want to put in there. So we could easily cut down the cost of the station equipment by a factor of 10 just for the, the data loggers alone. And that allowed us to then save that money that we can now spend on sensors instead of just the data logger hardware itself. So it was really exciting for me to take a lot of that knowledge that I've had over the years and try to come up with something. And I decided that the uh, about that same time where we had a, uh, a grant to start teaching some of these the workshop uh, to um, uh, some school people, uh, school children and people in uh, like citizen science type programs. So I wanted to leverage some existing programs so we didn't have to do a lot of education of how to how to build a circuit board from scratch or do a lot of stuff that would require uh, an engineering degree or experience with electronics. So I decided to use the Arduino platform. Uh, next slide. Um, that 
if you've not heard about Arduino, it's been around for, I guess, almost 10 years now. It's an uh, open source uh, hardware and software program. Uh, and this is like a slide from their website. And there's, there's lots of great information about it on there. But they, they sell a lot of pre-made boards uh, that, that do a lot of really cool stuff. But the nice thing is that they've got software and a, and a great ecosystem of support out there already. There are books and videos and tutorials. So we didn't have to train people on the platform. We could allow the Arduino uh, uh, community to have that uh, the, the knowledge base out there so that we could just leverage that when we design a, a board and a data logger that was going to use that, that, that platform. So by using that, it gave us a, a springboard into uh, being able to, to have an easy to use um, uh, platform that non-engineers could use. It's really great for students and, and people who are not engineers to use, but it's very powerful so that engineers can use it. And there's some really cool tools involved in that. On, on the next slide, you'll see what we've turned into for our Enviro DIY uh, is, is the same sort of idea with the Arduino platform is we have, we share all of the plans. So the uh, we've got web pages that talk all about the hardware and the schematics and uh, the board diagrams, everything that you need to know for the physical side of thing. But then there's also the software side where we share uh, all the sample programs and the code and everything that you need to make one of these things work. So it, we've got the whole package there. Uh, so we're doing similar to what the Arduino uh, kind of umbrella does with their own boards and software. It's just that... Uh, our board is specific to what we need to do, but we, we basically, everything that you need to know is, is completely open and shared like that. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see there's a um, kind of a, a chronology of, of some of the boards that we've used. We started out with the board on the left, which was the Arduino Uno. And then uh, if you're familiar with those, they, they basically have these little headers on there where you can plug things in vertically, uh, like in a, a modular kind of uh, side of uh, way of doing things. And uh, the first two there on the left were, were ones that were our initial maybe six or eight loggers that we built. And um, I, I realized at that point that it, they, they kind of did what we wanted, but I, I wanted more features and I wanted the better battery life and extra pins. And so we, we started using another board called the CGUINO Stalker. Um, and, and that had kind of what we needed on there, but then I had to build a smaller green board that plugged on top of the commercially available red board. Uh, to get it to do what we wanted. And that was really great, except that about two years into using that, the company completely changed their design and changed a bunch of features and made it not compatible. And so at that point, we said, well, we'd really like to be in charge of our own production and our own supply chain so that we can make one of these or 10 of these or thousands of these and, and know that then we're not gonna, they're, they're not gonna change and that we can build them exactly the way we want. So that's where I came up with the Mayfly data logger and basically started from scratch and designed my own board exactly what we, the way we wanted it and put everything that we wanted on there. And on the next slide, you'll see some of the different photos that we've had over the years uh, from about two, 2013 to 2020. And the first like four versions there, I went through very quickly because by the time we put them out and a little bit of practice, I realized, you know, I could change this, add some features, whatever. But by the time we got to version five in 2015 and 16, everything was pretty much the same. And we were able to, uh, to just produce those for the last five years. So we've had a, a really good uh, uh, community and, and great feedback and, and really good results with that version. Now on the next slide, you'll see this is the exciting news. This is the big reveal here that um, is the, uh, the release of the brand new uh, Mayfly version 1.0. Uh, it's the world premiere of this. You guys are the first people to see it. I just published it on our website about three hours ago, but it's the middle of the night here. So nobody over here has seen it yet. So this is the first time uh, outside of our office that anyone has seen this photo or any of the, the, the descriptions of what we're going to talk about right now. But this is the brand new board, which is it's got everything that was on the old design, but I added a whole bunch of new features and modernized it and updated it and put some newer chips on there and made it more powerful and, and, and did a lot of really great revisions over the last like nine to 10 months um, to get it to where it is now. And there's also some new features. We've released a, uh, a brand new cell board because um, 
we were having issues with the manufacturers. We couldn't even get the, the cell boards that we had been using. So we're just making our own now. We've got a Wi-Fi and Bluetooth B. We've got a little LCD screen that shows you live data and a whole bunch of other really great accessories that we're launching today. And uh, on the next slide, you'll see there's a, a great uh, little slide here to show some of the features of the, the board. I won't go through all of them, but all this is on our website. But you can see this tiny little board that's only, uh, well, I've got one right here. It's only about, uh, you know, slightly bigger than a, uh, than a, the, the standard cell phone, um, actually a little smaller than most bigger phones nowadays. Uh, and it's got all these great features on there. Uh, and it's completely user programmable using, uh, the software that, that we share on our website. So then the, a lot of questions people say is, oh, well, this is really great. I really like this. Where am I going to get it? Well, um, originally we were only planning to, uh, make like just a, a, a few dozen of them for our own internal use, but it turned out to be uh, cheaper to, to when we got them manufactured to, to make a whole bunch. And then we thought, well, gosh, what are we going to do with these extra few boards? We don't, and I thought, well, why don't we try putting them on the internet? And we've been just um, super popular from people all over the world who have purchased these. So we used to sell them only on Amazon, but a few years ago, we started up uh, our own little Enviro DIY shop page. So on the website, there's a, a link to the shop where you can buy like in quantities of five because it's a lot easier for us to, to, to send out five rather than uh, uh, buying large quantities from our Amazon shop. Uh, right now, there, there's the Products aren't in either shop right now, just because of the release of the new one, but they will be here in the next week or so. So, um, but that's where they are available. Um, we, the websites are set up to right now only sell things to uh, people in the US or at least North America. So um, the, the hitch there is there are lots of people who have bought these from various places all over the world using like a mail forwarding system or something like that. So I'm sure you guys probably know a way to get US products over there if you uh, if you so desire. So we don't have a direct way to sell to people in the, in, the, uh, in Europe or other countries right now. Um, we're still investigating that and trying to come up with ways to easily do that. But um, we are just a water research place. We're not an international reseller of stuff. So it's one of those, uh, at some point that may change. But for right now, you, you can get it through Amazon or our shop if you use a, uh, a, a method of getting it they're using a, a US-based shipping to get it started. Yeah. Um, but on the next slide, you'll see what we can do with the, these data loggers is, well, they, they work with basically any sensor. It doesn't have to even be a water sensor, but because I work for a water research uh, place, everything that we use has to do something with water or weather or uh, something like that. But there's been people who've used these for all sorts of robots and automation and all sorts of other interesting things. But we mainly use uh, off-the-shelf commercial research-grade high-quality uh, sensors. The benefit there is they're usually calibrated or they at least have some, some uh, very good uh, reliability so that you know uh, that the, the, the readings you're getting, like soil moisture, there's a carbon dioxide, water depth, uh, conductivity, turbidity, uh, a variety of sensors that we use uh, and because we have saved our money on the data logger side, we can spend that on those good high quality sensors. And once you know that you've got high quality sensors, then they generate the data. It's just the data logger that stores it. And then that you know that your data is high quality and can stand up to um, any sort of uh, analysis in terms of, uh, of, of data quality. So on the next slide, you'll see a kind of a sample of some of the places that we put those sensors. Uh, we put them in farmers' fields and um, uh, on the edge of streams, and um, there's rain gauges. We put them in estuary environments and salt water and and brackish water. Uh, we've got weather stations, soil moisture sensors uh, down in the ground. Um, basically, any type of sensor that you can think of can be connected to the Mayfly data logger as long as it's as long as you know the protocol and you have the right voltages and you know how the, the way that you need to get things to communicate. So uh, there's been very few sensors that that we have not been able to interface with. 
there's been just a couple of random ones that has some sort of proprietary output that a vendor wants you to use their logger with their sensor, so they make it really difficult. But 99 and a half percent of all the sensors we've ever tried to use connect to the Mayfly, and we support that in the the, the code and the software that we that we've uh, developed over the years. So on the next slide, I'll sh it shows a little bit about what we what we do with that is. I've been building hundreds of these data loggers for our own internal use, and we've kind of figured out what works best for us, and now we share that with everyone else on the Enviro DIY website. Uh, and then over the years now, we've had a lot of uh, requests for us to show people how to do that. So we started doing it in person years ago, and now with COVID and and um, all the things going on in the last two years, we transitioned over to virtual workshops so we can teach a hands-on training to people either in person or virtually by providing a, a list of uh, content, a kit with everything in there. We can either provide the hardware or give you a shopping list and you go out and buy everything that's on the list or something very similar to what's on that, that list if you can't get those exact parts. And then we show you how to put it all in a box and waterproof it and then put it out on the stream and put the sensors in the water. And then we also tie in the whole uh, database side of things with, uh, with the Monitor My Watershed. So in a one or two day workshop, you can go from having a box of parts to having a station outside and transmitting data to a website in real time. And it's really exciting for people to do that. Uh, and I think we've taught something like 35 or 40 workshops now in the last couple of years. So it's, uh, it's been really exciting. To, to kind of fine tune that those workshops and the content and, and what we've done with that. And we've put all of that into a manual that's like a hundred and something pages long. So all of that is shared online. Uh, and we also have uh, videos of those workshops and some other videos and content we've put together so that you, you can do a real-time workshop with us and we can work with you or you can just download all that material and kind of take the workshop offline by yourself and buy that uh, kit either from our shop or the components and make it yourself. And you don't have to do it exactly the way we show here. It's one of those, it's do it yourself. It's somewhat of a creative type of thing. And we just show what has worked best for us through trial and error. But if there's other ways that people wanna do things, we fully encourage them to, to do that and then maybe share those ideas back. Maybe we'll learn and improve what we've done. A lot of things that we've built into this station have come from other people that have shared back, hey, why don't you do this? And we're like, that's a wonderful idea. So we, we really love it when we get feedback from the community and everybody kind of builds this uh, together over the years. On the next slide, you'll see uh, I, I did just kind of another um, kind of uh, breakdown of all the things that go in. There's a data logger that goes in the box and a handful of sensors and the typical Mayfly, that's the older version that's on there. And we put it on a station, and then the, once the station's on the on a pole, uh, the sensors go down in the water. Our typical stations are usually conductivity, temperature, and depth, or a CTD sensor, and a turbidity sensor to tell us about the clarity of the water. But we also sometimes add a dissolved oxygen or pH or uh, other uh, chemical sensors in to look at the water. Uh, and in farmer's fields, we do things like soil moisture and soil temperature and, and various sensors that we would use in the ground. And then we also have weather stations in other locations if we need uh, meteorological data and things like that. Uh, and on the next slide, you'll see kind of what, what the end product is, is now you've got a station on the stream bank with sensors in the water and you get some great uh, you know, data. We use, typically record data at like five minute intervals. Uh, this data logger, when it's not taking readings, is basically asleep. So it's asleep 99% of the time. It wakes up for a few seconds every like every five minutes and just takes a, an instantaneous reading and goes back to sleep. And on the small watersheds that we monitor, five-minute intervals is is what we really need. Sometimes you could even see, get a little bit more than that for higher resolution for very, very small flashy streams. So if you're doing things like soil moisture and there's a sensor down two or three or four meters in the ground, 15 minutes is plenty for that because the ground temperature doesn't change that often. But if you've got a weather sensor, like a rain gauge, or maybe uh, rain gauges we do at one minute intervals, uh, but typical stream gauges we record at five minute intervals. So now you have this really great data that's stored on the memory card in the, in the data logger in the field. 
uh, the Mayfly can typically hold something like it's on an eight megabyte card, so it'll hold about 3,000 years of five minute data. So you don't have to worry about running out of memory and having to go out and download your logger because it, it stores way more memory than you'll ever need. Uh, and so all that data is stored on the device. But what's really nice is if you can transmit that data to a web portal because you're gonna be able to increase your data quality and your response time to things. And on the next slide, you'll see kind of a sample of some of the things we've seen over the years of fouling, the sensors get covered with uh, algae and uh, other things in the water, or they get kind of fouled up and buried in sand. Animals will chew on cables. Sometimes uh, vandals will come along and steal your station, uh, or maybe a flood happens and knocks the, the data logger in the, in the, in the, into the water, like trees and rocks and things will come along and knock things over. So if you've got 300 or 400 stations out like we do, we don't have time to visit everyone on a regular basis. But if you had all of this data on a website, then you could wake up every morning and look at the map and go, oh, this station is offline or this one's uh, data, it looks a little, little bad. I'm gonna go out and, and clean it. And so my vision before years ago, even before we could do this was to, to be able to put stations online because I, I had a monitoring project that was about two hours from my house and there were 400 uh, wells that we were monitoring the water depth on. And we had to drive there every week for two years and go out and measure the depth of water in these wells. Uh, and the whole time I was thinking, gosh, it would be really great if there was some sort of electronic device that would send this data to some sort of like thing on a computer. And th this was like almost 20 years ago. So all of the technology didn't exist. So it's, it's really exciting for me to finally have this dream I had 20 years ago of live data on the internet from low cost homemade devices collecting real time high resolution scientific data. And it, it's just been, it's been really nice to see that. So the backbone of all of the database and, and all of that collection is the Mayfly and the technology. But then it's, it's another big heavy project just to have that data side of the, 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 um, the, the project. So, that's my portion of the hardware gadgets kind of side of things. Scott's gonna wrap up now with the third portion of this triangle, which is the, the data side and the protocols that we use for sharing all of that data online. Thanks, Shannon. Uh, and so, yeah, to round this out, I'm gonna talk about that data sharing portal, monitor my watershed. And it kind of it kind of spans between the platform side of things as a way for people to share data and also addresses the protocol issue of making that data accessible not just on that platform but across multiple platforms <laughs> so as shannon highlighted the um so the, the mayfly or choose your data logger of choice uh it doesn't have to be a mayfly as long as it can communicate to the web through radio networks, or in our case, we predominantly use a 4G networks, uh, you can send that data to a web portal. Um, and I'm gonna give you an example. Today, we, I'll talk about Monitor My Watershed uh, for the reasons that it, it ultimately leads to fair data. But you could send the data to any type of uh, portal that you'd like. Think Speaks another example that some people have used within our community. So Monitor My Watershed is a, is it a web-based data sharing portal uh, that is currently uh, free to use and it's being hosted currently by Limnatech, uh, the company that Anthony Oftenkamp uh, has moved to after he left the Stroud Center. And so this is a collaborative effort between the Stroud Center and Limnotech. Uh, and the, the entire portal is soon to transition over to Amazon Web Services so that we have more flexibility uh, and a better ability to scale that and add new features, et cetera. So let's just a quick snapshot of what it looks like. Maybe you're already there. If, you, if you're watching this, you've probably already gone there and started poking around. Um, but the first thing you'll find on the Browse Sites tab is a map of the, the world with the little pins that show where stations are that are color coded to how recently data has come through on those sites. You can search for sites based on organization on the left uh, and by site name at the top. There's also, you'll notice here, I mentioned very early in this presentation 
leaf pack network. Uh, and you'll see that there's a data type on the upper left here of my screen for leaf pack. So leaf pack network, it's a separate initiative. It's under our wiki watershed umbrella of tools, uh, but it is a, a way to use macroinvertebrates to conduct experiments and explore stream water quality. So that's to emphasize that Monitor My Watershed, as I'm going to tell you a little bit more about in a minute, is capable of ingesting far more than just time series data. But if you're sharing time series data and you click on one of the pins on the map, the first thing you'll get is a description of the site. And then as I'm showing on the left hand or the right hand side of my screen, uh, sparkline plots of the last 72 hours worth of data and a description about the site. So it's an easy way to quickly visualize the, the data from that site and to see what uh, parameters are being measured. Uh, you'll notice also in a uh, tiny little time series analyst button there uh, on that on the right hand side there. So if you click the time series analyst button, you can pull up a data visualization tool that allows you to customize the axes, customize the parameters that are being plotted for one or multiple sites. I picked a, a random example here from New Zealand, uh, just to emphasize that we, we are international. There's actually one site in the UK. Uh, if you're looking on Monitor My Watershed right now, you're probably seeing that site. So the time series analyst is really helpful for particularly for working with uh, the citizen science groups, and Shannon mentioned that along the way, that we have uh, in our region, we have 50-some environmental nonprofits that are using uh, this tool and DIY and Monitor My Watershed to help them manage their uh, citizen science programs. So a good tool for lots of purposes there. So let's, let's move and really hone in on the protocol aspect of Monitor My Watershed and what makes it fair. Uh, um, so again, we're focused on the open source aspect of this. We're focused on ensuring that ultimately the data that people are sharing on Monitor My Watershed is being shared in a way where it's findable, not just on Monitor My Watershed, but across uh, what has what is being called in the United States. I'm not sure I'd be very curious to know if you've heard the term Internet of Water over in the UK. Uh, but we're, we're thinking about the Internet of Water as this network of hubs and producers and users of water data. So it needs to be findable and accessible. Uh, in, in other words, machine readable so that you can, this uh, data crosses uh, different platforms for visualization. Interoperable, meaning that there are multiple ways to to send data into a database and extract it, and then reusable, it needs to be documented. So how do we make that happen? Uh, so Monitor My Watershed is a, an example of an implementation of the observations data model two. Uh, observations data model two was designed by some scientists to, and researchers in the United States and it provides the, the core of the core uh, data service that Monitor My Watershed provides in terms of a web browser and these functionalities, but also the underlying databases that, again, allow us to ensure that this data is fair in those four ways. So in this plot, just an example here that um, just two things to highlight. So the, in the Mayfly data logger, or name your data logger of choice, uh, would be connecting to this Monitor My Watershed through HTTP post requests to send data into the database. And that's being served up on the user interface layer, uh, but it's also being translated into the database itself. So let's talk more uh, about that. So the, the observations data model two is the underlying repository that's managing the data. And that data is being exchanged through Water OneFlow for Python uh, with other uh, data hubs uh, for not only sharing data machine to machine, but also uh, cataloging metadata. 
So there's, a, there's an acronym on this slide that I'll have to define for you. And it's the Consortium of Universities for the Advancement of Hydrologic Sciences, that's KUASI. It's an academic, academically led uh, initiative within the United States funded by the National Science Foundation and, and others. And in our case, we're using KUASI's hydrologic information system as the node to which we then share data with the internet of water. And again, I'd be very curious in our Q&A coming up uh, to, to learn if the internet of water is a concept uh, and an initiative that's reaching the UK. I'm sure you have your own nomenclature for that, but it's certainly what we're trying to, uh, to build out in the United States. Okay, so uh, that's a, the quick under the hood of the observations data model two which is being manifest as Monitor My Watershed. We've had great uh, use and uptake of Monitor My Watershed uh, and data records are growing quickly. So that's, again, that was really the impetus to move this off of servers into the cloud so that we can manage this data flow more efficiently. So we've given you a lot of information. We've shared a lot of tools. We've shared uh, what probably, uh, hopefully is a common vision between the need to develop um, the people side of things, the platform and the protocol side of things. Uh, we have tons of documentation. And if you wanted one place to start, you would probably wanna go to wikiwatershed.org uh, and go to the help resources and click on monitor. And this will take you to various help resources for all of the things that we've talked about today uh, and allow you to dig deeper into the monitor, monitor my watershed aspect of things. Uh, three websites to go to uh, there on the screen. And also, if you're, if you're on the data management and thinking about the database and data management side of things, the underlying observations data model too, I encourage you to take a look at the Frontiers in Earth Science paper that Jeff Horsberg and colleagues created to share not only what the observations data model two is, but how it was manifest as monitor my watershed. This is all open source. Anybody can then translate that observations data model two into their own version, their own flavor, flavor of monitor my watershed. So this is all open source, it's all out there and we're uh, excited to contribute with the community uh, to develop these tools further. So that's all I have, and we'll look forward to taking some questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Scott and Shannon. That was uh, a lot of information in a, uh, in a really concise uh, package. So we really appreciate you, uh, you sharing all those resources with us. And I would certainly encourage everyone to have a poke around on those websites. Um, they're, there's so much material on there and it can seem intimidating when you first start, but it's all clearly explained. So, so do have a go with it. Uh, we have a few, uh, a few questions. Um, I'm going to start off with, uh, with some from the, uh, the Q and a box. Um, first one from Mike Pryor Jones saying, thank you for a great talk. Can you give an indication of how much relative effort you put into hardware, software, documentation and community building work? Mike, great question. Uh, and I don't have I don't have a uh, clean statistics to throw at that and proportion it out uh, as a percentage. Uh, you know, when we think about, I can think about it in terms of staff time uh, that are playing roles in all of this. And of course, Shannon has masterminded and maintains all the hardware development side of things, uh, and some of the software. If you if you go to uh, Enviro DIY, you'll, you'll eventually run across uh, a code base that's been developed by another one of our staff, uh, and it's intended to be a data logger agnostic uh, repository of various code that will run various sensors. So the idea is make it a little bit easier for people to do plug and play with a variety of sensors with a data logger, not just uh, the Mayfly. So there's another um, FTE, there's another uh, person involved in the software side of things. We all play a role in the documentation. Clearly, Shannon's done a ton of work um, most recently to document uh, the hardware and software side of things. The community building, when I think about it in terms of effort, 
Um, this is a much larger effort. We have our education department at the Stroud Center has been involved in building out uh, programs early on through different grants to uh, develop workshops, to train people. And there are uh, three full-time people that are managing the community building side of this at the Stroud Center. So maybe in terms of effort, maybe if I, uh, the, the general answer would be, we probably spend more time with the community building and outreach side of this. Uh, anything else that might be a short answer. Thank you. Um, a question from Beatrix Schlaub Ridley, um, who says, thank you for an excellent talk. Could you tell us what temperature range the mayfly has been tested at so far? Um, well, the mayfly board itself, it uses industrial range electrical components. So there's no, um, there's no problem there in terms of temperature. We've had, um, I've had them down to minus 10, minus 15, minus 20 C a few times. Uh, at that point, it's more of the, the lithium battery that powers them, doesn't really like to be that cold, uh, especially you're not supposed to even charge a lithium battery if it's below freezing. So around here, usually when it warms up during the daytime, the sun comes out, it kind of does a little bit better, but it's usually the battery that's a bigger issue or the fact that we've got sensors in water. And when it's that cold, the sensors and the ice freezes and things get damaged. So the mayfly itself is very, very hardy. I've had some that have been out for five or six years and are still working fine. The only thing that kills them is moisture. If there's a leak in the box or um, some sort of condensation happens inside the box, then the circuit boards don't like it when they get wet. Uh, and in the summertime, uh, a, an enclosed opaque box in the sunshine will get up to 40 or 50 degrees Celsius in there. So it, it's like a little miniature greenhouse. And again, that heats up the circuit board but it's not a problem. I've actually tested the mayfly when in development by putting it in my freezer and putting it in my toaster oven and, and doing extremes with it. And again, it, the board doesn't, doesn't mind it, but you really don't want to overheat a lithium battery because they tend to burst into flames. So it's more of the battery or the sensors that are going to be the temperature extreme uh, problems for you, because otherwise the circuit, the circuitry can handle uh, really, really extreme conditions. Thank you, Shannon. Um, I'm glad to hear I'm not the only one with uh, science experiments in my home freezer. Yes. Um, so a question from Oliver Tills, who also says, brilliant talk, thank you. Um, their group are at an earlier stage in the development of approaches for measuring biological responses of early stage aquatic animals alongside environmental data, which is tied to a web-based interface. Do you work with cameras or video and integrating this into your other systems? I don't know that we've done any type of work with video in that context. We do have community science programs that Shannon's interfacing with that use video, real-time video on their rivers where they're monitoring data to visualize changes, but uh, match what geomorphically is happening in the stream with the sensor measurements they're making. Shannon, do you have any follow on to that? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I tinkered with that back actually years ago. It was it was easier to just have a, a camera, a, like a time lapse camera, taking a video or a photo of a um, of a stream rising 15 or 20 years ago, uh, because um, uh, the sensors and electronics were were a lot different back then. So I actually my, some of my first environmental monitoring equipment was a homemade camera uh, time lapse thing to, to use to, to monitor floods like that. But um, there are much cheaper and easier ways to do that. But yeah, because we've used the, the sensors that we've got nowadays, we haven't had a need for that. But I know there are a few folks out there who are using that. And there's, there's especially with new with the computer image processing and stuff, you can do some really uh, amazing science with cameras and, and video work. But uh, we don't have an easy way to interface that with monitor my watershed just yet. And uh, we don't use it in our research, but I know people who are using that. Thank you. Um, question from, from Matt Fry. Um, what are the key considerations you've had to make or lesson learns when it comes to making this sort of initiative as self-sustaining as possible? So uh, from self-sustaining, I'm going to interpret that as from the perspective of our Enviro DIY community that we're trying to 
built on the web. Um, and and what we're what we're ultimately shooting for is yeah that kind of grassroots support from the community to not only share with to answer other people's questions and we're getting there uh, and it's really exciting now with 700 plus people interact on that website it's exciting to see how much people are giving and supporting each other and answering questions um, in terms of uh, Shannon might have some add on to this, uh, but I would say one of the things that we worked really hard at is to provide extensive resources and documentation uh, there. So there's, we have videos of how to's, uh, we have uh, manuals that we've interactive manuals of how to do every step along the chain from, you know, how to install Arduino and, and for, for beginners all the way to we think of as more advanced troubleshooting and how to deal with your data uh, in a troubleshooting fashion. So I think the, my key answer would be to make the resources available and to make sure they're easy for people to find and use. Shannon, any follow on there? No, I think you said it best. Is, that's the whole point of Enviro DIY. That's what the Y in DIY stands for yourself because we want people to be able to do this and we just want to provide them with the, the hardware and the tools and the software and you know a platform to use it on, but they need that information of how to put it all together and how to maintain the station and how to, once they put it out there, how are they gonna keep it running for years and collect that, that um, the data that they need. So to make it self-sustaining, the, the last portion of everything that we do is to make sure that the end user uh, is able to continue and, and find the resources that they need. So we put a lot of effort into all of that support network so that once someone does have one of these uh, instruments that they have all the tools that they need so that um, they can ask us or other people on the, in the community to, for any of that help. And, and that, that's been a real, uh, it's, it's been so exciting to see the, I think the, the, the chart of users that we've had on the website looks similar to the, that, that up, upward curving line of uh, data because it's, it's exciting every time I log on to see more and more people are joining and other people are answering questions and we're just building that, that community and that support network. So it's been really exciting to see it grow over the years and I'm excited to see where it's gonna go next. Thank you. Um, a, a, a question that I have, which is um, a sort of slightly, uh, slightly more operational academic one. Have you, how have you found getting the project funded because a project like this relies on having long-term funding for for personnel to to continue doing it and science agencies are not always so keen on uh programs with monitoring in the title you know they want new stuff how have you found getting it funded um creativity <laughs> persistence um and exploring all the resources we've we've been very fortunate to have some our world, uh, a three a three year or five year NSF grant is a long grant uh, to have. Perhaps that's similar there. So uh, these initiatives really started out with some of those longer term three to five year grants uh, that we were able to to really make headway. Uh, and there's been lots of we're creative. Uh, we find ways to make this project and these products relevant to other programs, other initiatives, and other communities. So I think that's an important part of, of finding the resources where you can. Uh, and that means making it relevant and finding outcomes uh, that people can achieve with this uh, to take it in their own direction. Of course, it helps that we really promote the open source side of things. And uh, this is free for ever, anyone to take and take it in their own direction. So I think that's another helpful part of being flexible and making sure that you're thinking about the outcomes for the stakeholders, for the communities that you're working in. Thank you. Um, and then uh, a final question um, from Stephen Hallett um, our, uh, on our panel. Um, two, two questions really about remote access to the data loggers. Um, first, have you considered um, developing the board um, so you can uh, update the firmware, for example, from a central location, so you don't have to go out to the systems to do any updating. And second, 
is there a way of um, doing adaptive monitoring frequency? For example, if there's an event that you see, can it trigger um, increased sampling and then go back down again? Can you do that remotely or do you have to visit the site? What, what are the options for remote? Yeah, those are great questions. We, we've, we've, um, we've tackled those issues both over the years. Um, the remote programming, it can be done. We don't typically do it because we have to visit our stations fairly regularly to clean them um, because it's a sensor in the water. So uh, it, we're, we've got to go out there or, or the data is not going to be good quality. So we're going to be visiting it anyway. So it's just as easy to just program it then than to build the technology and to, to program it. There are a lot of data loggers in locations, but there are no radio coverage. There's no cell phone or Wi-Fi or anything. And there's, it's just like, actually in the, this photo, that's my background is up in the Catskills of Southern New York. And there's, there's no cell phones or anything anywhere. And you got to hike a couple of miles into the woods to visit a station. So stations like that, the only way to get to it and update it is in person. Um, but there are cases where you could uh, do an adaptive sampling where you could take more frequent data than, than, than is necessary if, especially if it was a station like um, is on the edge of a farmer's field and doesn't see very much rain, but maybe a big rainfall comes and you want to take super frequent readings. But most of the time it's completely dry and you don't need to be sampling a dry field with no water in it. So in those cases, yeah, we've done that where if it, did, if it detects water or a change of a certain rate, uh, then the, the sampling rate increases, but then when it, it goes back to a, another slower rate after that event, uh, we've done the same thing using rain gauges or uh, pumps that sample water based on when water gets to a certain depth, it will actually trigger relays that will uh, uh, turn on water pumps to sample water and do things like that. So yeah, you can make it as smart as you want because you have full control over what the circuitry does and you can add any sort of circuitry to it. Uh, a typical station that we normally use just takes data every five minutes for standard stream measurements, but we do one minute increments. I've got, a, I had a data logger that was taking uh, one second increment readings and filling up lots of data really quickly, but it just, it really depends on what you're, what you're sampling. But that's the, that's the benefit of having full control over the hardware and the software is that you can do whatever you want. If you buy a manufacturer's product and sometimes you can only choose from a drop down box of a certain number of choices of something and you can only use sensors from that one manufacturer. And with ours, you can hook up any sort of sensor and make it do whatever you want. And that, that's been really nice to have the, the flexibility and the, the, the ability to, to work with just about anything that we've ever tried to do. So. Great, thank you very much.